a handsome boy. Ricky, can I say something that you may hate? Go on. I think you, I think you should have a kid. Right. OK. <laughs> Uh, in what way? Be a father or just have a kid? Go and get one? Go no, and... I, I think you should have a family. Because I've always thought about you and Simon Cowell. Whenever I read your interviews, I always think there's something missing. I think you make a great dad. Me and Simon Cowell? If he's up for it. Simon <laughs> <laughs> Fred? Do you hate that question? Uh, no, no, I feel a sitcom coming on. Yeah. But... Ricky and Simon adopted a kid. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. Yeah. Oh, Ricky, what are you doing? I... Hey, I'm doing what I'm, I'm bathing the baby, Simon. <laughs> you don't bath it like that. It's already written. Good one. Talking of sitcoms, you and Stephen Merchant are working on a new project. First yes. there was The Office, then there was Extras. Tell us about the third one. This one's called um, Life's Too Short, and it shows... It's sort of a fake documentary. It's about um, the life of Warwick Davis, who's a real person, but this is a, a twisted version of And he's help. a dwarf, right? He is. Why bring that up? No, I don't know. Chris is telling me he's about to... <laughs> I've got to do this. Sorry, um, Warwick, if you're... He doesn't know he's a dwarf, he just thinks... <laughs> I've been all fun now, I don't he, No, he, he, oh, we haven't told him. He just... It, oh, he doesn't know. Well... Because he's, he's, he's blind as well. So he, no one's told him he's a dwarf. So now he knows. Well, now he, he does know. First time's the night. And it's, um, it's about him um, having a sort of... Uh, a bit of a midlife crisis and his, his um, career's on the skid, so he's done this sort of reality show to try and get famous. And myself and Stephen play twisted versions of ourselves as well. Yes. Well, good luck with that. Got it. Right then, today is Thanksgiving <laughs> in the good old US of A. God bless both of them. It's Thanksgiving today. Happy Thanksgiving. Carl's going to tell us what it's all about. Ricky, what are Carl's qualifications as some kind of international culture guru? He hasn't got any. <laughs> really? I miss it. You're going to tell Seriously, I, I don't know why you got me on for this bit. <laughs> <laughs> so you could plug your video. Come well, on. Yeah, that's, that's out. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now you're going to do this bit. It's just a... Uh... Uh, before you do that, should we have a clip? Yeah. Okay. Is there yeah. a clip of you by Christ in Rio? Here it is. So, come on, Carl, that was pretty good. You are the idiot abroad, you're now the idiot with the turkey. Tell us about Thanksgiving. Uh, Can we I show that turkey? We, well, it looks lovely it. there, doesn't it? But look where they were facing us. That's, what they, that's the view that was facing us. <laughs> is, any, right? is anyone doing this in this country? Would anyone... Yes, of course. Yeah. There's some Americans over here, people who have American relatives. It's a big night for those guys. Tonight. But would they be watching this anyway, yes, then? They or will. they be eating... This is their pre-Thanksgiving show. They watch it every year. Tell us uh, about the origin, Carl. I told you about this. We got a, I've got a podcast out about called Thanksgiving, free on iTunes. Give now. us. Give, and I was telling you about the one power Indians. I wouldn't. They... I wouldn't worry. It's mainly. I mean, anything with Americans, they like eating. Yeah. So that's, they tend to. No, I'm not having a go. That's right. That's a fact. <laughs> so. But they've they they definitely have gone off the no, turkey listen, now. Listen, it looks listen, like Arnie Nora. Listen, listen to angle. what they what? eat. What? There's a thing that they eat called Tadunkan. Right. And what they do, they get a turkey. They shove a chicken in that, and shove a duck in that, and that's why it's a Tadunkan. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, what? round of applause for that one thing. Give me a fact. <laughs> Cheers, Carl. <laughs> well, thanks to you both, uh, and good luck with your DVD <laughs> battle in the charts of a Christmas. Yeah, who's going to win the battle of the DVDs, guys? Idiot Abroad. It's, I think it's n number one or two or something. Only, I think only Top Gear's beating it. Top Gear? Who's still watching Top Just turn Dave on. <laughs> it's on every night. All right. Uh, thanks, Ricky. Giving. Thanks, Carl, for being on the programme. about you it's always it's always a, an element of, of humor or comedy even in your m m mother's funeral I'm a you... dad yeah my mum and dad funeral we were yeah. mucking around um, it, even when um, my dad my mum died first um, and um, it was a long horrible illness it was uh, it was lung cancer it? it was lung cancer and it was it was dreadful I mean the worst situation you can imagine it was dreadful um, so there was a certain amount of um, you know, relief afterwards. She was out of pain and everything. How long did but, she have it for? Oh, uh, a year. A year. It was. It was. Anyway, it was. It was dreadful. I remember. Yeah, it was. It was dreadful. Um, but uh, you know, when we were organising the funeral, um, the uh, the vicar said to my brother, "And tell me something about your mother. What was what was she?" And my brother, just mucking around, said, uh, "She was a keen racist." <laughs> Isn't that right? And the vicar went, oh, I can't put that. He went, I'll put gardening then. And then he gave the vicar the wrong names of the kids, so when he went out, we all laughed. The wrong names. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> at, my, at my dad's funeral, I went prepared. I got loads of nieces and nephews. And I went, and they all started sort of crying, and I handed out tissues. And then they all started laughing, because I'd written things like, stop snivelling <laughs> and whinging. <laughs> and, so they, and the vicar was looking at us laughing during his funeral. Aww. We explained to him afterwards. But, yeah, no, that's, ex that's, exactly, what it, that's exactly what humour's for. 
Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about Derek. Derek is, is uh, your new series. Yeah. Uh, and, or your latest series. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, he's a quite different guy. He's very different from David Brent. Yeah. The um, office. Uh, it's funny because I, st I still deal with sort of like, you know, flawed characters. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I suppose sort of these are more outsiders. But the, the, the flaws of the characters are usually delved into with like people like David Brent or Andy Millman. Mm -hmm. Um, it was their own fault, you know, it was, it was ego or ambition or jealousy. Mm. Whereas with these guys, it's superficial stuff. It's like bad hair, a mm. shuffle, a, a funny voice, of, you know. Um, so, uh, and, and that was because I wanted it to be superficial and something important could come along and trump it all, which was kindness mm. or compassion or caring. And I put it against a, um, an old people's home because... Um, I always try and write about what I know, um, uh, and about six of my um, family, uh, my mum, my sister, my sister-in-law, her kids now, they worked in care homes. So I sort of had that backdrop. And again, they'd come in with stories that were really... Some were really sad, and some were really funny, and some were really sweet. And I remember first people first watching Derek, they'd say, is it a, is it a comedy or a drama? And I went, well, what's your life? You know, it's a bit of everything, isn't it? You're doing a new movie, right? Yeah. Yourself, I see like yeah. that. Yeah, called yeah. Life on the Road, and it's yeah. David Brent trying I'm to be a I'm not trying star. to get to the Derek. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. You've ruined your flow, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I had this sorry. wonderful Carry on. Sorry, flow. I'm sorry, if, Freddie. Are you in charge? Well, I used to be. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Can you get what me a you beer? Because they said they wouldn't allow like beer on Do we have some beer? <laughs> He's in charge, see? <laughs> Freddie, you're in charge. Claim it back, I'm so sorry. No it's, your, it's yours. I have another show next Do week. the intro. We're, we're, <laughs> you can cut this bit out. We'll pretend. We'll pretend there's the... Yes. Yeah. OK. We're so we're going to watch a clip from Derek now. <laughs> They're laughing, they know, see? <laughs> <laughs> this is never going to cut together. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to cut straight from your interview <laughs> to, to this clip. Yeah, I know. <laughs> your well, terrible trauma, <laughs> and then you go, <laughs> anyway, Derek. <laughs> it's it. It's... <laughs> The number, honestly, the number of shows I've done where I'm going on to do something about a comedy or a children's book, and the person before me is just a, a, the, one of the first one of the first shows I ever did. It was like a daytime show, and they said, "Coming up next, the hilarious Ricky Gervais and his funny menagerie flannels." But first, why do teenagers self harm? <laughs> <laughs> and then, there's this, well, and I had to go out there. It was just a dreadful. It, it always happens. It always happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> you did it on purpose, didn't you? They got, they got kidnapped on purpose, just to ruin... <laughs> take a look, take a look at this. Derek. This, this. This is a clip from Derek. I goes, oh, whoops, sorry. And people goes, oh, don't worry about it, Derek. Ask them. But if I drops a baby or sits on it, whoops, oh. sorry, isn't it? No. <laughs> I actually think like that. When someone says, do you want to hold it? I just yeah. think, well, no, wait, no, what if I drop it? You know, so, uh, yeah. So how, how are you? With, you? You chose not to have kids. Yeah, but I've got, I've got loads of nieces and nephews and they're having kids now. And so how that's, are that's you with them? Are you, are you good A working-class family. I'm a great, great uncle. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, 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 it's not like it's... They're like mice. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I come home for Christmas and they're through the pockets and everything. <laughs> Coughing on you. I'm always ill after I visited my family. <laughs> Thirteen kids. <coughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> I lose weight after Christmas, where I've, I've got some sort of illness. <laughs> no, I love, I love, I love kids. Other people's. <laughs> I love other people's. You, don't want it you can stop. play with them and go right. That's enough. I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one final question because we've been talking about uh, about uh, her getting married. Are you ever getting married? Because you've been um, with the same woman, like, for... Yeah, 30 years. Well, 30 we are years. sort of married. 30 years? Yeah. Was 18, 30, OK, yeah. so he's... But we are sort of married. It's just, you know, um... Mm. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't really see the point in a ceremony. You know, we, we share everything. Everything's in both our names. It's, you know... I don't want our families to meet. That wouldn't work. <laughs> 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 That'd be like Game of Thrones. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we've got loads of toasters. We don't need to get married. <laughs> Ricky, it's, it's great to have you here. Thank We're going to have another guest on. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Here is Ricky Gervais. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. 
out there. Well done, Winslet. I told you. Do a Holocaust movie. The awards come, didn't I? <laughs> See? <clears throat> Trouble is with Holocaust films, there's never any gag reel on the DVDs. I don't know. There isn't. It's, uh... Now, don't do it. It'll be fine. Don't. <laughs> But you all look lovely, all doled up. You came here in your limos. I came here in a limo tonight, and the license plate was made by Felicity Huffman. So, no. Shush. How are you? Nice to have you here. Oh, it's great to be here. Yeah. yeah. Nice new studio. This is new. This is yeah. a new experience, yes. Yeah, it's great to. Giant moon, big fake moon behind you. Actually, the uh, studio was easier to find than the channel on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> All female remakes are the big thing. There's a female remake of Ghostbusters. There's going to be a female remake of Ocean's Eleven. And this is brilliant for the studios because they get guaranteed box office results and they don't have to spend too much money on the cast. So... <laughs> Shut up, I don't care. You're it's so <laughs> macho, aren't you? I know, I know. It's a You're so handshake. tough. I'm glad you've got your shirt on. <laughs> you always have to show a bit of that, don't you? <laughs> no, no, no. It's no, for I'm... the menopause of women. No, goes, oh, look, he's <laughs> taking his shirt. He walked to the restaurant the other week <laughs> <laughs> carrying a stag. Who do you think you are? Four. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. You're one of about five people that have been invited round my house. I'm a very sort of private person, apart from, like, you know, workmen and postmen. Um, and, uh... You make me feel special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had Alan Carr, a postman round here. <laughs> Refuse uh, collector. Yeah, well, they're, they're, at least they're useful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh... I can't believe this. Uh, you, you had a birthday, and is it 50 years old? You're not 50 years yeah. old. Are you really 50, 50 years old? 50. 50, yeah. I mean, you look tremendous. You look like you're 35. If somebody had said to me, uh, how old? I said, 35. A 35, honestly. You look exactly like you did the first time, except you're in better shape. Remember you used to come out in your sort of pear shape when you come out? <laughs> now you look great. <laughs> you look You, look you didn't good. say that at the time, though, did no, you? No, I didn't know what See, to, I didn't know what to think. Well, no. You said, well, you look good now, because I looked awful before. That's all you're saying. <laughs> I needed you to say it before. You go, you're pear-shaped. I'd have worked out faster no. than now. <laughs> but but how, how do you feel at 50? Good, right? Well, yeah. I'm grumpier. I think I'm grumpier. Grumpier? Yeah, yeah. I understand you a lot more now. If it, do you know what I mean? No. I never knew you were this weird. Really? <laughs> no, because you, you kept it... You, we were yeah. working together for a couple of days. And you, I know. You're absolutely mental. <laughs> in, a, in a nice way? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so... Stop all the signs say, chill, bro. Sorry, 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 uh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, you're not, you're, still... not, you're not giving them, you know, they come out, <laughs> they, they park their cars, they've got babies that they haven't paid, why would you? That'd be mental. But, <laughs> but if I was you, I'd be going, thank you so much to these people, and giving them, you know what I mean? A new series of extras starts yeah. this week. Uh, congratulations on, well, on getting a second series, essentially, but also... Congratulations on already fucking it up. It's next week, you moron. <laughs> It was shoddy. It was, um, I mean, you, you know, you, di you didn't write it, and that's... But, do it like... But... Do it like it's your own. Do it like you were clever enough to come up with this joke yourself, OK? Because <laughs> I would love to try stand-up. I'd love to do stand-up. I, I think you'd be it. good. I think you'd be good. You say that, but I, when I try and write a joke, I get, I get the opening bit. I say, that's a funny idea. Madonna's got divorced. And then I think, yeah. Where's my writers? You know, I don't... Well, yeah, I don't... <laughs> know. And I went out and said... I've got no Will Smith material, and they got a big laugh just because they were thinking it. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that's my show. I wasn't there, right? And I said, um, people on Twitter, it was trending, people saying, oh, what, what would have happened if Ricky had been hosting it? And, mm -hmm. I, and I said, nothing, because I wouldn't have made a joke about his wife's hair. I'd have made a joke about a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I haven't offended anyone. I didn't mean, it's not my fault. There's a lot of powerful people here, so if I said, it's... <laughs> Honestly. I like a drink as much as the next man. <laughs> Unless the next man is Mel Gibson. <laughs>
Betty, you went to the Achilles heel of everybody. Like when you tell a woman who's, you know, that her that it's, you know, she looks old. That just hits a woman it's, deep it, in the. What, 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 I think you said something about the Sex in the City women, like about. I said it was airbrushed, and I said we know we know how old you are, girls. I saw one of you in a in an episode of Bonanza. Okay. No, I was saying, why lie? There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being 50 or looking 50. But you're not a woman. I yeah, but, but, and I, I get you. I but I don't you. think you lose your sensuality at 50. Wasn't ready, didn't look for something new. I was out with my friends the night that I met you. You look so handsome, told you it was someone's boo. That was up to you, show me that you wanted me to. No, just looking at all the faces here reminds me of some of the great work that's been done this year by cosmetic surgeons. Um, <laughs> it is an honour to be here um, in a room full of what I consider to be the most important people on the planet. Actors. They're just, they're just better than ordinary people, aren't they? That's, no, they're, 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 we all know that. Um, Imagine a world without actors. Oh, God, it doesn't bear thinking about it. Imagine if they ever went on strike. Oh, what would we do? You couldn't replace them. You couldn't replace them with any other profession, lawyers or doctors. Can you imagine a real surgeon doing what Hugh Laurie does in-house? It would be pathetic. <laughs> He'd be all over the place. We'd go, oh, where do I stand? How's my American accent? What, what's my lines? You know, Hugh, with the aid of coaches, stuff, can eventually learn his lines while saving lives. He's a genius. <laughs> How could you replace Kiefer Sutherland in 24? I'd love to see a real anti-terrorist agent try and defuse a bomb in a busy train station in one hour. <laughs> Some of those scenes, by the way, where Kiefer grabs someone and beats them to a pulp, they weren't even in the script. Um, <laughs> the director just said, keep rolling, we'll work it into the... <laughs> but actors aren't just loved here in Hollywood, they are loved the world over because they're recognizable you can be anywhere you could be in the third world okay and you get a glimpse of a hollywood star and it makes you feel better okay you could be a little a little child a little asian child with no possessions and no money but you get a you see a picture of angelina jolie and you think oh, mummy <laughs> about our next two presenters the first is an actor producer writer and director whose movies have grossed over three and a half billion dollars at the box office. He's won two Academy Awards and three Golden Globes for his powerful and varied performances starring in such films as Philadelphia, Forrest Gump, Castaway, Apollo 13 and Saving Private Ryan. The other is Tim Allen. Well, you know, like, like many of you, we recall back when Ricky Gervais was a slightly chubby but very kind co comedian. Yeah. Neither of which is he now. Mainly Star Trek memorabilia, because I love Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm such a nerd. <laughs> have, you never been, have you never been in a Star Trek? No, I've never been in a Star Trek, but I love the original series, so I have, oh, okay. like, I have the Gorn head from the original series from the episode arena where... Like, they know what <laughs> I know, I'm just... I'm not, I'm just Oh, the gorn head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the gorn head. Okay. I have. <laughs> I have. What the f is a gorn head? Uh, every time you're on the program, I try to do this, and it always comes out very clumsy. Let me try it one more time. Possibly the best television show ever. What do you think? Oh, uh, possibly. What do you mean? <laughs> What have you named your private parts? <laughs> um, <laughs> Pamela. <laughs> Our next presenter is the Queen of Pop. Not you, Alton. Sit down. This is... She's all woman. I'll give you some clues. She's always vogue. She's a material girl. And she's just like a virgin. Please welcome Madonna.
If I'm still just like a virgin, Ricky, then why don't you come over here and do something about it? I haven't kissed a girl in a few years. On TV. to The One Show with Matt Baker and Alex Jones. Now, tonight we are joined by four-time Olympic gold medalist and world record holder Michael Johnson is with us. Hi, everybody. And Michael is going to tell us all how, with a simple online test, you can find out how competitive you are. Yeah, but that's not all. No. Oh, no. We're also joined by a man who hasn't got any Olympic medals and holds no world records over any distance. No. But on the plus side, he is quite funny. It's Ricky Gervais. <laughs> thing on competitiveness yeah. tonight. It's now, yeah. obviously, you're a very successful man. Do you have that competitive drive? Uh, over trivial things. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Uh, like um, Tiddlywinks. Uh, oh, Tiddlywinks, pub quiz. Uh, pub quiz, I'm, I'm heckling the, the, the presenter. And I'll, I'll, I'll be pedantic. I'll try and just get one extra point. Oh, it's terrible. Okay. It's awful. I'm a typical bloke. I can't lose at Trivial Pursuits. That's, that's, forget it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll talk to Michael about that later. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Little Running? Yeah. yeah, carry on. You can win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, brilliant. Well, Ricky's here to talk about his brand new series, uh, or the third, ep third series of the series, The Ricky Gervais Show, uh, where he appears as a cartoon. And uh, it's not a bad likeness, this. No, it's not. <laughs> but watch out, Ricky. Watch out, because if the similarity gets any closer, you might accidentally stumble into Uncanny Valley. Mm. I hope not. I think it's a bit creepy. That is, that's creepy. It's that whole thing that you just can't relate to that character at all. You know they've got no emotion, yeah. so therefore it's a bit weird. Do you, what do you, do you make of Emily there, Ricky? Um, well, I, I think the technology is amazing, but I think yeah. when it's an animation, it sort of defeats the object, really. I think that, that there's, there's less escapism. It seems, it seems to... Yeah. I don't know, you might as well get the actor in. Well, that's what I think, exactly. Although I'd rather have one of them do me, so I don't have to turn up. So. <laughs> But, I mean, the style of the characters in the Ricky Gervais show, I mean, that, that's oh, well, key, I, isn't it? I, well, I wanted that to be really retro and cuddly because the things we talk about are so out there and quite challenging. Yeah. That I, I, wanted it, I didn't want it to be trendy and spiky and, and challenging in any way, so yeah. I wanted it sort of, you know, Hanna-Barbera and sweet. You know, and um, I sort of designed the original sketches and sent them off to the, um, the animators who are uh, amazing. Um, so and, you, uh, you, you, can't, you had... You oh, with the original drawings, they obviously made them. Oh, they brilliant. are really yeah. lovely. Right. And yeah. then... Um, uh, they actually said, um, with mine, between um, uh, Series 2 and Series 3, they said, um, oh, you've lost a bit of weight and you've got a beard now. Do you want to change it? And I went, no, that would be too expensive. You know, so <laughs> leave, me, leave me fat and shiny. What do I care? No, but I like it to be a time capsule. I like those. Even if Carl got hit on the head now and he suddenly became really smart, they're a little... Do you know what I mean? Yeah, he's yeah. there forever. My note on him was even rounder. I kept going, look, he's, round, he's rounder than that. I said, we've got compasses. We're draw I said, no, he's rounder than that. Right. Just keep it going. <laughs> compasses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the new show is back on Tuesday, isn't it? Yeah. And, I mean, it, it looks like you three friends in there having a chat. I mean, how much of it is ad-lib then? How it's do all you ad -lib. work it it's out? All, people, people say... Is it scripted? As if we bother scripting that rubbish. But do you have it's topics worked then? It's worked well though, doesn't it? I mean, are well, you surprised the, at that? Because we, we, we went in there, I did it as an experiment, I thought it'd be funny. I'd just love being in a room with Carl Pilkington, he's my best mate. I'd be doing it anyway, I'd call him all the time. I'm going to call him after the show. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and I just thought, that, that's fun, I think that's what, you know, normal people do. They chat, mm -hmm. and I, we, tr we tried to do that, and then... We put it out, uploaded it as a podcast, and it went crazy, and then, you know, this happened. Uh, yeah. But it was just an experiment, it was just fun, it was, it was a labour of love, really, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but it is, it's just, no, it's, not, it's totally ad-lib, yeah. 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 Well, let's have a look at one of the shows, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great. It's his sort of, he observes the world, but then he makes up his own facts. Yeah. Like, he's obviously heard that... They like the taste of goose, so they're nicking stamps. That quantum leap to them nicking stamps. <laughs> and then they're sweating glue. I like right. that, sweating his, glue. His knowledge of the animal kingdom is fantastic. Yeah. It's just great. I love to get him on the big subjects, because he's, he's amazing. <laughs> but, but this is actually the third series, and, you know, historically, you don't do a third series. No, you? it's Office usually, and extras is two. Yeah, two series and a special. But you've got to realise, with this, someone else is doing all the hard work. <laughs> 
<laughs> I just, I just chatted. I'm just, I'm selling this the third time now. Um, no, it's the third season. I mean, it's 39 episodes, which is more. I think that's more than the Office Annex has put together. <laughs> but we are doing a special of Idiot Abroad. He's off on his travels now, so. You know, um, yeah. you know, you do put him in, in, in the well extraordinary situations. Do you ever feel you know bad for that or not? Uh, no, he's, he's my gift to the world. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think he's the funniest guy in the world. He's my best mate, and um, uh, and yeah. for people who say I'm bullying him, uh, uh, write in if you want to be bullied by me because you get your own series, you get a new house, and you become a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad deal. Is well, it? Well, listen, one of the big part, well, big parts of the animation is, is your laugh. It's brilliant. Okay, we've got a little, oh. got a little game for. Well, brilliant to some. Well, Some people want to uh, scratch their own ears off. Well, well, let's have a little reminder of the laugh. Here we go. Nothing makes me laugh like him. I just, he's like that. Well, people say, is he real? Well, if he's not, if he's not real, he keeps the act up 24-7. Yeah. Yeah. He's just funny all the time. Well, I tell you what, we were wondering, weren't we, whether you could sort of guess other people's laughs. So, guess the laugh this game is. Um, now, mean, the famous, famous people... people. Famous people, yeah. yeah. As opposed to, <laughs> just he works in our chip shop. Oh, <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> That's, got that's three. Norman. <laughs> We've got three. Okay, Ricky. Listen right. up, here comes the first okay. one. <laughs> Sid James. <gasps> Nailed it straight away. That's really good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay, here's our second famous laugh. <laughs> Again? <laughs> uh, I've no idea. Think about it. He's a friend of yours. Come on. There he is, it's Jimmy Carr. <laughs> okay, stop it, stop it. <laughs> Isn't it creepy after a while? It's and like a ghost. <laughs> yeah. It is. This third one's quite hard, isn't it? Um, yeah, good luck with this one. Here we go. It's a female. Well, I didn't get the last one. What? Female what? Singer. Female it's singer. It's a female singer. Human. Human. Yeah. This is the, that's her actual laugh. Do it again. <laughs> yeah, I, I like it. Go on. <laughs> one more. Not, it's Adele. <laughs> wow. Wow. What a that's game. good. Wow. <laughs> She's got a lovely voice, but not when she laughs. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, there we are. The third series of the Ricky Gervais show starts next Tuesday on E4 at 11.30. Mm -hmm. Now, Ricky, anybody who follows you on Twitter will know you're a big cat lover. Yeah. You post pictures of you and Ollie the cat quite yeah. often. Aww. Aww. Right across Britain. There we go. Uh, but did you know that uh, as a, a cat lover in the 1960s, you could walk into Harrods and pick up yourself... I can't believe it. ...a oh. lion cub. That's ridiculous. Mm. It does sound absolutely mental, but anyway, uh, here's Giles to explain all. Hey, Goose pimples, that has. What a moment. Oh, me really and Giles have got tears. It's an amazing hey, is story, right? isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's an extraordinary story, and it is not unique. I've got another bit of footage to show you now about Queeby the gorilla. Queeby the gorilla was uh, brought up in captivity at the Aspinall Family Zoo in Kent, hand reared for five years. Then he became too big. They knew they had to release him into the wild. Yeah. They went to West Africa, to the Gabon, and they gave, as it were, uh, Queeby back to nature, as they rightly should. Five years later, Damien Aspinall thought, I'd like, I wonder what, what's happening. Mm -hmm. So he went to Africa. Five years later, the last time Queeby had been seen, he had attacked, twice he'd attacked humans. And Damien went in a boat to try and find him. Came to the shore, calling out his name, looking for this wild gorilla. And watch what happened next. And I go and see him and he embraces me and hugs me. I and mean, there's just not many better moments than that. But you know, you, you, you develop these incredibly strong emotional bonds because they're so closely related to, to us. See, Damien and the gorilla had not met for five years, but the gorilla definitely did remember. And this is all to do with something called imprinting. Essentially, about 100 years ago, this was discovered. When uh, baby animals are born, indeed, when um, uh, birds are hatched from their eggs, the first thing they see, if it, even if it's an inanimate object, the first thing they see moving, they want to follow it. Mm. It imprints itself on them.
And this actually has had some wonderful implications in terms of conservation. Condors in California were dying out. There were about nine of them left in the early 1980s. Because condors, great wild birds, they only breed when they're about six years of age. They breed quite slowly, only one egg every two years. So they had this idea of actually taking the egg away from the live condor, letting it hatch, and then showing the condor a puppet of a condor. Here's a photograph of a puppet of a condor apparently rearing a baby condor. This enabled the adult to give birth to another chicken and, and lay another egg, yeah, yeah, and they yeah. were able to, as it were, rear these baby condors with puppets of condors. And now, in California, from, from nine, there are about 100 and, I think it's about 178 condors. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's that, yeah. it's that interesting argument of should you allow the imprinting to happen with the humans, which obviously it happened there with, you know, with the lion cub yeah, and, well, and the, the gorillas. Yeah, well, the is, you know, if, in general, you shouldn't keep wild animals. It's simple as that. The fact they are so intelligent and mm -hmm. um, it, it proves what you, they shouldn't be imprisoned for our amusement. They're not yeah. here for our amusement. It is a privilege, and that's a nice ending, but it shouldn't have been in Harrods in the first place. You know, it's... No. It's, it's people see things like this and they think, oh, how cute, I could have one. And they, they just, just shouldn't. Yeah. You just shouldn't keep a wild animal. Mm. Just and it can't be done that, yeah. of course. There was legislation yeah. well, that followed yeah. that that yeah. made it impossible. And it does now make a contribution to conservation. So it's a, it's yeah, a difficult that's, one. Yeah that's, yeah, that's different. Well, thanks, Giles, for that. Yeah, thank it's lovely. You, Giles. Thank you. Now, the Boeing 787, or Dreamliner as it's known, has landed in the UK for the first time and from mm. next year will be transporting thousands of us on our summer holidays. But well, the makers claim that it's uh, one of the quietest and greenest airliners ever made, so we sent the uh, sceptical Matt. Matt. Yeah. Uh, we are joined now by Olympian and world record holder Michael Johnson. <laughs> A brand new BBC online experiment today, looking into sports psychology, aren't you? Right, and it's uh, you know it can help anyone. So anyone who goes online and takes the test can be helped about you know in terms of the pressure they feel, whether it's a job interview or speaking in front of people or sitting next to Ricky. You know, <laughs> it can help you, you know, understand how you deal with pressure, and um, and then all of the data that's uh, that's you like that. Huh? Yeah. All the data that's collected um, will help scientists and, and psychologists figure out, you know, what type of characteristics actually make people better at uh, handling pressure and, and worse. But, but the one thing that most people don't understand is that you can improve. So yeah. you, don't have to, you don't have to stay where you are. It's interesting, Tess. We did it this afternoon. Yeah, you find out in what conditions you, you work best in. Yours was happiness, happiness. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And mine was excitement. And then, you know, you give your little tips as we go. Now, Ricky was saying earlier on, and kind of jokingly, but pub quizzes and trivial pursuits <laughs> and stuff like that. What state are you in when you're playing that? Because this is the key, isn't it, Michael? It is. I just, I just want to win. But are you angry? Are anger. You yes, exactly. Anger. You can... <laughs> no, no, it's sort of tongue-in-cheek, but it's that thing of, uh, what, what, I, I, I pressure. Um, I, I suppose... I, I do go from naught to 60. I can be having the best day in the world and something goes wrong and it's like, yeah. oh, for f yeah. yeah, so it's, it's, what, well, I told him, what? So it's, it's angry. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I suppose I, um, yeah, I like, um, I try and rule stress out of my life, actually, so I, I avoid stress by getting, <laughs> making sure things are okay. I don't know if that, yeah. that, that doesn't counts. Mean, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to perform better when he's angry. Mm. I'm not, I mean, you, you would need to take the test to see, but I don't, yeah. you know, some people feel more comfortable when they're angry. Like, I felt better and I competed better when I didn't really like one of my competitors. Right. But you right. can't really rely on but yours that. yours is I don't, explosive, I don't, isn't it? Yours is this sort of, like, right. physical. But I don't yeah. want to have to be running around trying to find somebody to be angry about, you know, <laughs> before I go into a race. Yeah. So you can't really rely on that. No. And you want to make this the biggest experiment of its kind ever, don't you? Yeah. It's competitive. I, it, yeah. We just launched <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's That's why I'm, I'm doing a bigger <laughs> one. It's, uh, it starts on ITV <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Okay. Oh, come on, Michael. So, yeah, the idea. Yeah, let me go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, we, we just launched it this morning. 18,000 people have already signed on to it. Right. And uh, so we want to get over a million people. And, this will, and, and again, it helps people understand better how they deal with pressure and, and how to improve themselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we can see you here in outstanding form. This is you. It's 16 years ago, I think, uh, setting the 400-metre world look record. Look at him go. Just look at the distance there. The gut between you and second, it's just absolutely remarkable. And you, you, you're kind of beating yourself over time and set that record more and more and more. But how, how secure do you think it is these days, Michael? You never know. And, um, you know, somebody's going to break it one day. You never know when someone's going to come along, some kid who's tremendously talented and 
who takes the online experiment and finds out that he performs really well under pressure and he goes <laughs> to the Olympics and he breaks my world record. And then, you know, and look, the, the special thing about records is, is breaking them. Not yeah. sitting, I'm not doing anything right now to hold it. And I'll, I'll never forget the moment I broke it. It was a great sense of accomplishment, and, and I'll always yeah. have that. Well, yeah. it's so inspiring to talk to you. Thanks it ever is. so much for dropping in. If you want to get involved with a Can You Compete Under Pressure test, then all the details are on our website, or you can go direct to bbc.co.uk slash compete. Thank you so much for coming in, Michael. Ricky, lovely to see you. Uh, the Ricky Gervais Show starts next Tuesday, E4, at 11.30 p.m. On tomorrow night's show, it's only the greatest living painter that I know. Do you know who it is, yes? Ralph Harris? Indeed. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> for the evening, ladies and gentlemen, Ricky Gervais. Thank you. Hello, and hello. Welcome to the 68th Annual Golden Globe Awards, live from the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Los Angeles. It's going to be a night of partying and heavy drinking. <laughs> or as Charlie Sheen calls it, breakfast. <laughs> wow. Whoa. So, let's get this straight. What he did was, he, uh, he picked up a porn star, um, paid her to have dinner with him, uh, introduced her to his ex-wife, as you do, uh, <laughs> uh, went to a hotel, uh, got, got drunk, got naked, trashed the place, while she was locked in a cupboard. And uh, that was a Monday. What, what did he do New Year's Eve? Anyway, welcome. The Golden Globes is a celebration of the best in TV and movies over the last year, voted for by the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. It was a big year for 3D movies, Toy Story, Despicable Me, Tron. Seems like everything this year was three-dimensional. Except the characters in The Tourist. Um, I... I feel bad about that joke. I, no, no, I'll tell you why. I'm jumping on the bandwagon, because I haven't even seen The Tourist. <laughs> Who has? Um, but, no, it must be good, because it's nominated. So shut up, OK? <laughs> and I'd like to quash this ridiculous rumour going around that the only reason The Tourist was nominated was so the Hollywood Foreign Press could hang out with Johnny Depp and Angelina Jolie. That is, that is rubbish. That is not the only reason. They also accepted bribes. Let's... No. All that happened was some of them were taken to see Cher in concert. How the hell is that a bribe? Really? Do you want to go and see Cher? No. Why not? Because it's not 1975. <laughs> There were a lot of big films that didn't get nominated this year. Nothing for Sex in the City 2. Um, no, I was sure the Golden Globe for special effects would go to the team that airbrushed that poster. Um, <laughs> well, great job. Girls, we know how old you are. I saw one of you in an episode of Bonanza. Also not nominated, I love you, Philip Morris, um, Jim, Jim Carrey and Ewan McGregor, two heterosexual actors pretending to be gay. So the complete opposite of some famous Scientologist then. Um, <laughs> what? What? Probably. My lawyers helped me with the wording of that joke. <laughs> They're not here. OK. <laughs> There's been some great new TV drama this year, like Boardwalk Empire and The Walking Dead. So, uh, yeah. Talking of The Walking Dead, congratulations to Hugh Hefner, who uh, is getting married at the age of 84 to 24-year-old beauty Crystal Harris. Um, when she was asked why she was marrying him, she said because he lied about his age. He told me he was 94. Oh, come on. Um, don't worry. Hold out and just, just don't look at it when you touch it. That's done.
I warned them. Um, one of the biggest events in TV this year was the finale of Lost, one of my favourites, and uh, all the questions were answered, yeah. Um, I have to say, though, it was quite a complicated finale. I'm not sure I totally understood it all, but from what I can make out, I'm pretty sure the fat one ate them all. Uh, I, I think... Should we get on with it? Our first presenter is beautiful, talented, and Jewish, apparently. Mel Gibson told me that. He's obsessed. Um, please welcome Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> like Pac-Man. OK. You know our next presenter from such films as Hudson Hawk, Look Who's Talking, Mercury Rising, Colour of Night, Fifth Element, Hearts War. Please welcome Ashton Kutcher's dad, Bruce Willis. <laughs> Next up, Eva Longoria has the daunting task of introducing the president of the Hollywood Foreign Press. That's nothing. I just had to help him off the toilet and pop his teeth in. Um, it was messy. Please welcome Eva Longoria. That's my favourite film of the year. Um, the creator of Facebook, of course, Mark Zuckerberg, is reportedly worth seven billion dollars. Heather Mills calls him the one that got away. Um, the, ne the next two presenters are funny, charming and down to earth. He's Alec from The Rock, she's just Jenny from The Block. If The Block in question is that one on Rodeo Drive between Cartier and Prada. Please welcome Alec Baldwin and Jennifer Lopez. All right? I love this next presenter. He's so cool. Um, he's the star of Iron Man. Two girls and a guy. Wonder Boys. Sorry, these porn films. What? <laughs> kiss, kiss, bang, bang. <laughs> Bowfinger. Really? Yeah. Up the Academy. Come on. He has done all those films, but many of you in this room probably know him best from such facilities as the Betty Ford Clinic and Los Angeles County Jail. Please welcome Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> Our next presenters are two of the funniest people in America. She stole the show on Saturday Night Live, then went on to create, write and star in her own show, 30 Rock. He was a jobbing actor, career not going that well, if I'm being totally honest, who, who got his big break when I cast him in a remake of a show that I created called The Office. He's now leaving that show and killing a cash cow for both of us. Please welcome the wonderful Tina Fey and the ungrateful Steve Carell! <laughs> Welcome back. Now, our next presenters are young and thin, with hair and teeth. They're lovely to look at, which is just as well, because they're presenting the award for Best Foreign Language Film, a category that no one in America cares about. Please welcome <laughs> Olivia Wilde and Robert Pattinson. <laughs> OK. What can I say about our next two presenters? The first is an actor, producer, writer and director whose movies have grossed over three and a half billion dollars at the box office. 
He's won two Academy Awards and three Golden Globes for his powerful and varied performances, starring in such films as Philadelphia, Forrest Gump, Castaway, Apollo 13, and Saving Private Ryan. The other is Tim Allen. Welcome back. The next presenter is a national treasure, Miss Congeniality herself. This down-to-earth girl next door first stole our hearts as a bus driver and then as a railway fare collector. Now, of course, she wouldn't be seen dead on public transport because as she just said to me backstage, poor people are gross and they smell bad. Please welcome Sandra Bullock. Thank you very much. That's about it. Um, well done. Justice there. Thanks to everyone in the room for being good sports. Thanks to NBC. Thanks to Hollywood Foreign Press. Um, thank you for watching at home. And thank you to God for making me an atheist. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ricky Gervais. With me, Stephen Merchant. Hello. Creators, writers, Directors, star of The Office. If you're a fan of that show, Who isn't? yeah, then you've got a treat coming up because um, it's the entire first series. Well, if they're a fan, Rick, then they will have already bought the DVD and, and already seen the show. Oh no! Wait, let me finish. It's the entire first series, but with extra bits. We've got interviews of people. We've got. It's a retrospective. People talking about it. A-listers wow. chatting about why um, they think The Office is. Genius. Not my words. I'm not. I do think it's, it's brilliant. Yeah. Do you know my favourite thing in the office? Go on. You? Thought as much. Yeah. yeah. When I first saw the office, uh, I, you know, I was, I was struck by how original it was on a bunch of different levels. And I think upon first viewing, I thought, that's really great. And then upon my 38th viewing, realized how genius it was. My first impression of The Office was that it was a masterpiece. And unfortunately, as time passed by, nothing interfered with that glow. It was so fresh and new in terms of the style. And for me, it reminded me of a style of humor that, uh, you know, I, th I think, uh, you know, in Spinal Tap, Chris Guest and those guys created. I saw that show and I was like, this is incredible. When I first saw The Office, I thought, finally, there's something funny being done in the world. I think the thing that I was most struck by is how original a, a character David Brent uh, was. I've never seen a... A uh, character in a movie or in television who is that obsessed with what people think of him. Uh, and I think a lot of the comedy comes from that. He's got way too much self awareness. I can have a joke and a laugh with the people who, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to have authority over and they love me for it. And all that obviously is always you love watching Brent, but you don't want to be Brent, you want to be Tim. That didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen because of my overwhelming charisma. Do you know what I mean? It happened because they wanted Tim to be the. You know, the kind of, I suppose, the emotional focus, or at least they, they wanted him to be the audience, yeah. And he, and he was, you know. Apparently they, they had a completely different idea when they were writing it of the sort of person that, that uh, Gareth would be. He was supposed to be a much, much, yeah, bigger, more macho kind of guy. And, uh, and, and yeah, so I've heard that when, when I came in and auditioned, they, they changed their mind. Because if you're genuinely physically scared of somebody, if it hadn't, like, been Tim and Lee, that kind of character, then you just think, I think he's going to hit Tim. He's going to beat him up, you know. Whereas it's kind of Tim and Gareth, you think there's a man who thinks he's Napoleon. Every single one of those characters is so perfectly cast and in a sort of new, informal way. Hello, Wernham Hogg. And Dawn, just the perfect look, the perfect pitch. You know, not so fabulous that, of course, everyone will be in love with her, but you slowly fell in love with her while you watched her. I've got the kind of mm. hot hand, sorry. Right. Just don't touch my head. With Dawn, sometimes I wanted to give her a bit of a shake, you know, because she didn't pursue the guy that she really did want to. The camera is like another character in the office. It's a whole other member of our show. 
um, because it added so much depth, I think, to what people said and did. Obviously, one of the key aspects of the show was the sort of documentary style, and that had sort of been born out of how we'd originally got it made, and we shot something in a little documentary style. And we did that because it was a very quick way of filming. You can get a lot done quickly in a documentary style. You've got to worry about the finesse. And then, um, and then over time, we realised that the whole sort of documentary boom that was happening at the time, the sort of docu-soap, things like Driving School and the airport programme, were throwing up these amazing characters who suddenly were acting in a very specific way because of the fact they were being filmed. I think the most extraordinary thing about the documentary format, obviously, was Ricky's performance with the camera. That you had his ghastly behaviour, and then on top of the fact that he thought that his ghastly behaviour was absolutely excellent and cool and interesting and complicated. To the stage where they could actually make it. That's what made it a success, that they knew exactly what they were doing. We didn't want anything sexy anything sexy or cool or rock and roll. It was all anti that. The opening titles, uh, they just blew me away. I remember the first time I saw it. about. One of the first things that, that Ricky ever did as the David Brent character, he had a couple of scenarios in his head that used to play out for me when we worked together. One of which was his character, his sort of CD boss character, interviewing a woman and his slightly lascivious, lecherous yeah. manner, which is actually something we downplayed in Brent. Brent, in the original form, was a lot more seedy, perhaps, than he, he later became, but certainly that, that uh, scene where he's interviewing the girl. Brent doesn't think that that's creepy. He thinks that's romantic. He thinks he's a bit of a Lotharian. He's thinking he's set in the mood for love. <laughs> he doesn't think this is seedy or anything, does he? So uh, he thinks she's going to go, you're the most interesting man I've ever met. <laughs> And you're handsome with your little beard. <laughs> One of the things is it's a great physical performance by Ricky. You know, I mean, obviously the gestures have now become slightly over well known. The tie, um, and the, again, the, the looks to camera. But he does a sometimes, every so often, he will do bigger stuff. He'll be when a woman's around, as opposed to the way he'll be when someone who he's frightened of will be around. Some higher status person will be around. Regular guys working in an office instead of a factory or being a mechanic and what we did was we, we showed the difference between the two lad but he knows it's wrong and he knows this thing sexism he's heard of that and he knows about uh, misogyny he knows all those things he knows all the isms he just doesn't really fully hates having a woman as a boss deep down he hates it and he hates being undermined anyway by a woman he hates being undermined by anyone in front of the camera so it just his world just implodes in that episode. One of the other themes uh, in the office is comedy itself, you know. Um, uh, you get a lot of things off your chest. We had a go at uh, people just shouting catchphrases. Ricky, leave it! <laughs> <laughs> Props, just bringing in a, a funny thing. I would have enjoyed watching um, Tim and Dawn and their journey because because it didn't seem implausible and it didn't seem unreachable. Um, they made it feel as if you could have these little things inside you, these little stories that can come out, um, rather than it being this glossy Hollywood love story where they all end up brilliantly happy, but everyone's unbelievably rich and beautiful and in, you know, sunny lands and, and it doesn't feel like where we are, you know what I mean? And so I think I would have enjoyed seeing it play out. For someone like me, the romantic drama, particularly of the great Christmas special, you know, is one of the great romantic comedies of all time, one of the great romantic stories of all time. Uh, I mean, I think the very best sitcoms have had profound things at the bottom of them. I suppose that's what makes them good. All of my favourite shows have always had a sort of romantic strand in them, whether it be uh, Northern Exposure or Moonlighting or Friends. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons, it, one of the things we liked is the kind of soap opera feel that the best of those shows have. You know, soap opera not being a, a sort of um, a, a damning phrase at all, that actually there's something about watching from week to week and building an understanding of that world and caring about those characters that's very unique to television. And a lot of British comedies don't seem to do that enough, and it seems strange. You know, you're coming week after week, so you can draw people in. And, and so we were very keen to have that romantic thread, because we knew if we just kept going, it would just become the sort of beating heart of the show in a way. The supporting cast were actors, um, 
but uh, sometimes it just said in the script, uh, man one, woman one. And um, we gave them all names anyway, just in case it popped up, because we wanted that realism. They came in every day, they were sat in their seats, and they'd really be typing. And then um, one thing in the script said, uh, someone leaves a message on his answer phone, and it was, it was uh, Ewan. And he was just cracking us up. Hello, I'll call you tomorrow. One of our pet hates was exposition, where someone walks into a room and goes, Jonathan, you know your sister, the one that went to the Gambia, who's a doctor? Yeah. And, but we found out that we could do that with Keith because of his l strange, laconic tone. He could remind the audience what had happened and what was embarrassing. So with me taking a bite into the scotch egg, we're talking about watching peak practice. Boring, isn't it? Just staying in watching peak practice with your life. Yeah. Not for me, I like it. I'll just stay. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good. That was so good. Something would put us off or something would go and one of us would always kind of crack and lose it. And it just we just couldn't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> we got through three or four scotch eggs and eventually they had to they had to give me ones back that had a bite taken out of them because they didn't have enough bought for the number of takes it took. So a couple of times I had to disguise a bite that had already been taken out and go in again. Boring, isn't it? Just staying in, watching peak practice with your life. Yeah, it is. Not for me, I like it. Yeah, I just stayed in at a big... <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the 400,000 scenes that we couldn't do in under four hours because it was just a lot of laughing, you know. I was the worst corpse of all, yeah. I mean, it's strange because my job is to try and make people laugh for my own amusement, but sometimes that goes wrong and I can see fear in their face. Or I found myself funny and I'd laugh and ruin a tag. Also, even if you've written the lines, if they're funny, I still laugh. What's the difference? A dwarf is someone who has disproportionately short arms and legs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> What's the difference? A dwarf is someone who Fucking has... hell! <laughs> you can't help corpsing. You can't help. You can help put, putting people off yep, and making them corpse. But if someone's finding something funny, you know, um, I, 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 um... I celebrate that, really. I thought I found a, a lump. I examine myself regularly. I get checked out. It's fine, but terrifying. Testicular cancer. Cancer of them old testicles. What's that? <laughs> oh, no, that was a great one. We'll do it again. Please. We'll do it again. Damn. Steve came over once in the office and said, Rick. It's like making your own TV show isn't interesting enough for you. You've got to have other things going on. Um, and so, uh, I, I, yeah, I do, you know, I multitask. I try and get something in the can, and I try and ruin the tape for my own amusement. Action! 9.99 Pure Silk, so I have to snap it up. OK. He can't stand to do the same take twice, and so he would change something about it every time. Action! And uh, Wally Burton, two for ten quid, so I went, yes, please. <laughs> Something would have to be different, and that was the thing that would crack you up. Action! And, uh, you know, Deaf Nobby Burton, who comes around with a case, too, for... <laughs> Why are you making it harder for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I just say, I just say, Nobby Burton, who comes around with a case. <laughs> two for ten, I've got four. <laughs> I think sometimes he'll improvise an idea that will amuse him, and that will amuse someone else, and now Ricky thinks, right, OK, I've got them now, and then he will just keep going. He just thinks, well, this, for my own amusement, even though we're making a TV show, the clock's ticking, we're losing money, and we've got to get it on BBC Two, he's thinking no. That it probably contributed to making it so funny as well, because, because it was so fresh. Each one of those takes that, that finally got, got into this, the series was unique. I've only just reached a point where I can watch it now and enjoy it and not really be thinking about how it was made or what he was doing that day that was terribly annoying. Now I start to see it, I think, for the first time, as audiences do, and I can't remember some of the episodes, I can't remember some of the scripts. Jokes amuse me now for the first time. And so I've just got to a point where I can sort of see it and enjoy it. And, um, and now I feel more proud, perhaps, than I did then, because I really feel excited when I see a little clip of it somewhere, because it just feels such a, such a three-dimensional world. I think that's the thing you're always trying to chase as a writer, is, is a world in which people believe those characters exist and that somewhere they're out there. And that, I think, you know, is, is its sort of greatest, for me at least, our greatest achievement. Yeah, I mean, um, 
I, I've only got fond memories of um, everything from meeting Steve to um, Thanks, winning the Golden Globes, you know. What I think really, uh, you know, has changed American television is that by bringing over an American version of The Office and really staying true to the tone of the original and then it becoming a success in America has totally revitalized comedy on television in the States. I keep it on in my house sometimes just for comfort. Just I just keep it on. I'm not even necessarily watching it. I'm just sort of listening to it because I, I find it comforting to... <laughs> That's gonna, that sounds weird. Yeah, I, I keep my pants on. Staggered at how um, successful The Office has been worldwide, and I think that um, uh, what I love about it the most is that the characters are essentially the same in the remade shows. They, Brent is still Brent, and Tim and Dawn, still Tim and Dawn, Gareth still Gareth, even though the names aren't the same, the characters essentially are. At one time or another, every bloke in the office has woken up at the crack of dawn. <laughs> what? La chef perceptionniste. Mm. Uh? Oh, oui, oh, viens. Ah, viens. Oh, il vient. Ah, viens. À la camite. <rire> il est chiant, il arrête pas de me mettre du fromage partout dans mes affaires. Pero mille, pero comment il a perdu ça? Comment il a perdu ça? Pero quanta gente peut alimenter? I thought I found a lump. Realmente me encuentro un poro de una cuestión re fea. ¿Qué va a hacer de testículo? Me importa el testículo. ¿Se acuerdan? I look back and there was a, you know, that romance of with writing our first sitcom, you know. Um, but uh, I, I couldn't be proud of The Office. I, I honestly couldn't be proud of The Office, even if, if it hadn't won any awards and hadn't done. You know, I, I, um, I, I think that. Uh, I was proud when we'd finished writing it. I, I, I knew that we'd done our best. And it's the first time I've ever tried my hardest at anything as well. There was no, nothing really about that job, the entire job, that was not very enjoyable, especially in hindsight. Because you come away and you do lots, you know, lots of other jobs. I've done lots of jobs before and lots of jobs since. And as always, you don't fully appreciate things when they're going on, you know. You kind of, you forget, that, oh yeah, not, this isn't all going to be as much fun as this, you know. I haven't worked on anything that was such a joy to work on since. I've worked on some great stuff and, and, and had a great time, but there was something very special about that, um, about working on that, and, and we knew it. That particular job was full of nice people, funny people, smart people, and people that I was glad to see every day, um, and sorry when that ended. I'm still proud of it to this day, and you know, people ask me about it the whole time, and I'm always happy to to answer their questions because it's a, it's a, it was a very important part of my life and still is. My biggest ambition from a young age was to write, it honestly was to write and be involved with a sitcom that would be thought of, you know, fondly and possibly even amongst, you know, uh, the, the much loved sitcoms. And, and I feel like to some degree we've achieved that. And so now I, I don't know what I'm doing with the rest of my life. Now I've got to sort of recalibrate my expectations. Uh, now I'm just filling up the hours before I die. That's why I'm here today. That's not, that's not gloomy, is it? Well, you've, got, you've got voiceover work, though, haven't you? have got some voiceover work, yeah. I've got some, got some voiceover work. Barclays. <laughs> <laughs> Sell out.